Uh, this morning, though, we'll be uh, continuing in our look at the letter Paul has written to the Philippian church. And we've seen, what we've been seeing is how Paul's life, Paul's life is all about Christ. It's all about advancing the gospel. His life is completely centered on Christ and Christ alone. And in all circumstances, if the gospel is advanced, Paul rejoices. Because it is all about Christ. Christ is everything. When we look at Paul's epistles, we read them not just to hear what he said to the church back then, but what he, in essence, is saying to the church today. We, we should all be challenged by what we see in Paul and what we see in the church at Philippi. My prayer for all of us is that we come away from this letter rejoicing in the spread of the gospel, taking every opportunity to share the, the merciful truth of the gospel and to rejoice no matter what, no matter what the circumstances might be. Up to this point, Paul's been giving his brothers and sisters an update. He thanks them for, for praying for him. He, he lets them know how he cherishes their partnership in the gospel. He wants to reassure them. He wants them to, to see how he is always looking to Christ and not to his own circumstances. And through his faith in God, he knows, he knows that God is in full control. And we've also seen that his faith is also on display for all to see, the palace guard, anybody that came to visit him, all saw his faith in action. So this morning, we'll continue to read this letter together. But what I want us to do is, as, we, as we've been saying, that all these letters were read to the church, read out loud. So just picture yourself being among one of those house churches hearing this letter from Paul read to you. So we're in chapter 1, uh, verse, beginning in verse 27. Chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your, your flawless work. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on us in our unbelief. And we pray, Lord, that you, would, um, that you would comfort us, that you would speak to us through your word, and that, that we would draw closer to you through this time spent together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In, the, in this short passage, Paul transitions into the, into the rest of the letter. So let's uh, kind of think of this short little four-verse passage as like a hinge. It's like a literary hinge. We're going from the beginning, and now we're going into what Paul wants to speak to them about. <clears throat> Knowing their situation and circumstances and relating them to his own, we heard Paul say last week that, that he would in all likelihood remain rather than depart to be in Christ's presence. And he said that they could rejoice when he came to them. But now he's going to take the opportunity for the rest of the letter to disciple them because he's their pastor, he's their shepherd. He begins by, by firmly, in this passage, by firmly encouraging them to, to live a life that reflects the gospel of Christ, whether he returns to them or not. He says, whatever happens, whatever happens. He didn't know when or if he would return to them. The key is he doesn't want their lives to be centered on whether he's coming or not. Paul's concern is for their progress in the faith, remaining focused on Christ, not focused on Paul. Whatever happens, he says, whether I return or not, it's kind of like, you know, in the meantime, you know, between now and then. And what is he encouraging them to do? He says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It almost sounds like he's saying something like the parents said to you, like, behave yourselves until I get there. But, of course, that's not entirely what he meant. The, the Greek lends itself to say more like, conduct yourselves as good citizens. Live as good citizens. Well, well, citizens of what? Well, they were citizens of Philippi, which made them citizens of Rome. 
which meant they were living among the Romans, the same Romans that arrested their brother Paul, the same Romans that nailed Jesus up to a cross. And as citizens of Rome, they would be expected to acknowledge Nero as their Lord and Savior. So this certainly can't be what Paul meant. In a letter, remember, we only really hear one side of the conversation. We don't know other things that have been said. But no doubt Paul would have taught them that believers are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He told the Ephesians, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. He told the Colossians, he's delivered us from the, dom- dominion of, the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And indeed, we're going to hear later in this letter in chapter 3, where Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. So they're called to live a life as citizens of the heavenly realm in a manner worthy of the gospel. Actually, the word, it's a clumsy word. It's actually worthily, which is, uh, we, don't, we don't really hear that one often. It, almost, it sounds like it, it doesn't sound right, but it, it's a word. Worthily is a word. It's an adverb. It, it's an adverb. is a word that modifies a verb. So I'm giving you your high school English lesson for the day. But it says to live worthily. Live as citizens that honor the gospel of Christ, not harm it. Let your behavior honor it. So no matter what, whether I get to see you or not, in the meantime, live as citizens of the kingdom of God that honor the gospel and bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Live as citizens of the kingdom of God, submissive to his reign and rule in a way that identifies you as a member of his kingdom, called to be holy and pure. Live as the adopted children that you are, reflecting the honor of your heavenly father. Now this letter is for the Philippians. And since it's kept for us in the New Testament, it's for us also. So Paul's charge to live as citizens of the kingdom of God is for us too. We call Christ our Lord, don't we? We say it all the time. Lord Jesus. We call him Lord. But do we understand what that really means? I mean, what does Lord really mean? If you look up the, dic- the, the dictionary definition of it, it says someone having power, someone having authority, someone having influence, a master or a ruler over you. As our Lord, Jesus has authority over us. He reigns supreme over us. We are his subjects. Now, this is language we don't usually grasp in this country. <laughs> but as citizens of the kingdom of God, that's who we are. He is our Lord, and we are his subjects. Individually, and as a church, we're to live as citizens of the kingdom of God because the church is also to be submissive to God's reign. The church is the body of Christ, called to be holy and pure, set apart from the world, and point the lost in the world to the wonderful news of the gospel. He's the head of the church, and all authority over the church has been given to him. The church is to seek his will first before anything else. The transformative power of the good news of Christ should be evident in the conduct of everyone in the church, in all that we do. That's what it is to conduct ourselves worthily of the gospel, subject to his will, obedient to him. Our lives, individually and corporately, should reflect the saving grace of Jesus. Paul says that he hopes, in the meantime, to hear that they are all standing firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything from their opponents. That's a mouthful. That, that, that's a lot to say. Tim, Timothy was probably the one who delivered this letter to the Philippians after he served as a scribe writing it. And after his visit, he would most likely come back to Paul in Rome. So Paul is saying here that he hopes to hear a report filled with hope that would give him reason to rejoice even more. The thing is, living in the world as citizens of a heavenly kingdom logically presents a serious conflict. Living worthily of the gospel will be difficult. Paul knows this. And he explains that that there are really three character traits the the church should desire, the church should strive for. And those are perseverance, unity, and confidence. Perseverance, unity, and confidence. Paul likes to use military terms when it comes to the gospel. Remember, in the beginning of the letter, he spoke of the gospel advancing, like an army takes ground in a battle. 
And here we see another military term. He says standing firm. You know, standing firm like a, like a soldier digs into this post, not giving up any ground. And as ground is taken, the soldier stands firm not to give it back. So to stand firm is to maintain your position despite all sorts of pressures and all sorts of attacks. And that takes perseverance. Now, you might not even see any end to it, but you continue to persevere. The case of the church is persevering in one spirit, rooted in the same faith. They're each believers in Christ. They each know the mercy and forgiveness of God. They each know that Christ bore the wrath due to them on the cross. And they each know that on a third day, he rose again. They know that. And they each have had the Holy Spirit deposited in them, and they've had the confirmation of conversion. The spirit that is at work in each and every one of them, that is the one spirit that he talks about. Persevere in that one spirit. Draw your strength from the Holy Spirit. The spirit that is present in their individual lives and also in the church. The common present in all of their lives. Now back in verses 4 and 5, Paul said that in his prayers he was thankful for their partnership in the gospel. And we noted then that he, he saw that there was really a thanks for their financial support, which was a tangible example of their partnership. But, but there's a lot more to that partnership. He's speaking here of the bond that believers all share through the Holy Spirit. And here the call is for the church to stand firm in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Persevere. Don't give up any ground for the gospel. So you might say, well, okay, well, how, how can a church give up ground? Well, during those days, they, they were under pretty intense pressure to live as Romans. Remember, it's Nero's Rome. And how easy and safe it would have been to just give up and fit in with the rest. And that's how the church is today. That's how the church today can give up ground. We're not, we're not living in Nero's Rome. You know, we're living in a place that would rather just see the church just go away. I mean, they might not say it. People might not say that. They might even say, like, you know, it's okay. Just, just, just don't bother me with it. But we know that there are many who would wish that the church would just disappear. I uh, was given an article to read. It's called Season of the Witch. And it talks about witches and Wiccans and Covens all throughout Simsbury and Canton. There's a whole article on it celebrating it. <laughs> Those are the folks who would love to see the church simply just disappear. The world certainly doesn't want to hear from Scripture about anything. And that's nothing new. We have to remember that. It's nothing new. The world has been standing against the church since the days of Jesus. The Philippians had the exact same thing. It would be so much easier to just back off and fit in, right? It would be so much easier just to be more accepting. But think of all the sin issues we see in the world today that Scripture takes a firm stand against. And yet the unbelieving world would either dismiss them, write them off, or worse, they'll celebrate them. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if the, if the church would just let things go, be a little more tolerant, Things would be so much better for everyone, wouldn't it? Maybe we're just misinterpreting things and we're just taking this book too literally. Maybe that's it. Maybe we're taking it too seriously. Maybe we should just ignore those passages of Scripture because they make people uncomfortable. Maybe we're just too old-fashioned. My friends, the pulpit of the church that Jesus Christ established is called to preach the entire counsel of God and be true to God's Word. And I, for one, will preach whatever is said in God's word. The fact is, the world needs the church to stand firm and not give up any ground. Because God calls those who are lost through the church in one way or another. They're the ones that need the steadfastness of scripture and the everlasting love of God. They're the ones that need the gospel of Christ sooner than later. They need the holiness of God's word to convict them. They need the power of the gospel to wash over them. And as Peter said... They need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sins. So the church is called to persevere. The church is called to stand firm. Now Paul also said that the church is to be unified, striving together for the faith of the gospel, being of one mind, all on the same page. Everybody agreed. Because once an army is divided, it's easily conquered. If there are factions, loyalties will be split and there will be weakness. 
Paul implores them to be of one mind, loyal to Christ alone, loyal to their heavenly citizenship in the kingdom, striving. The Greek really here says like contending, struggling along with somebody else, all with the goal to surmount something that is difficult or to surmount some sort of danger. So you're standing side by side, completely together, united in one mind, united in Christ, united in faith. And that's what Paul points to here. Contending side by side for the faith in Christ, standing up against those that are seeking to break the faith of those who believe the gospel. Paul is saying, be unified as you contend and you defend the faith of the gospel of Christ. So let us be unified. The church could be so easily divided. The church is in a battle, and it has been since the beginning. And there are those that are looking to bring the church to her knees. And why is that? Why does the world just want the church to go away? Why does the church find herself in a battle? It's because the holy word of God brings about conviction of sin. The gospel takes away all control of your destiny from you, and it puts it all in the hands of Christ. And people don't like that. It's offensive. How many times have you heard people say, don't judge me. Who are you to tell me that I'm a sinner? No one wants to hear that. But it is his holy word and his perfect law that points out just how sinful mankind is and just how far we've fallen. And we can praise and thank God Almighty for fulfilling that law in Jesus to the point of settling the sin debt by pouring his wrath out on his son. I, uh, I belong to a, a ministerial organization, and uh, I had the opportunity to speak to a room full of ministers from, from many different denominations. And my remarks started off like this. I said, uh, I know we all come from different denominations and traditions, and we hold different stands on doctrinal things. But these are things we can agree on right here. God is sovereign. Christ is Lord. We were once lost in need of a Savior and have been found by Jesus our Savior. We have the Holy Spirit deposited in each of our hearts, and Christ will return to establish his kingdom forever. That the church can agree on. The church must remain unified as she contends for the faith of the gospel. We may have disagreements on many things. We're we're human, and that happens. But on the essentials of the faith of the gospel, we should not allow any division. God is sovereign. Christ is Lord and Savior. We have the Holy Spirit deposited in our hearts to guide, to convict, and to comfort us. And Christ will return to establish his kingdom forever. Thirdly, we see that the church is to be confident. He says, don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. Or another way to interpret this phrase is not be intimidated. And that was a real concern in Roman Philippi when you think about it. Remember, that the population of that city, they were relocated retirees from the, re, from the Roman army. They were hardened men. And they, and they had a pretty firm way of shutting someone down. So that, that could be really intimidating. But it was God who said through Isaiah, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. He is with each and every one in the church. And he is with the church. So the church needs to ask this. Do we believe it when we read in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Do we believe that? Do we truly believe that? Do we believe that Christ said that he would build his church and the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against her? It's Christ's church. It's not ours. It's Christ's body and we're a part of it. So why should we be intimidated? Why would we be intimidated? Do we believe that Nothing is impossible for God. Do we truly believe that? So to this point, we can summarize what Paul wrote. We can summarize it this way. If we were to recraft this this passage, we would say something like this. No matter what, in the meantime, live as citizens of the kingdom of God, honoring the gospel of Christ. I hope to hear that you're persevering and united and confident in the faith of the gospel as you stand firm from the attacks on you. That is a pretty significant charge. But it's a charge that's imperative because it has eternal implications for the lost and for the church. Now at that point, Paul, Paul makes like a, a sort of like parenthetical comment, like a thought that comes to mind midstream. In the second half of verse 28, he says this, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, 
but that you will be saved, and that from God. It's a little tough to understand that in English translation, so, so let's just unravel it a little bit. To make this work better for us in English, think, think of this statement this way. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but it is a clear sign of your salvation, and that is from God. So what then is this clear sign that he's referring to? When we look in the context of the passage, the clear sign is the persevering, unified, and confident church whose faith is in Christ and stands on the gospel alone. It will be a sign to those that oppose the church. Because if the church is living as citizens of God's kingdom and therefore has eternity in view, the church will not fall to the pressures of this fallen world. Now think about it. The church has survived for around 2,000 years. Many people, many societies, many nations, many governments, other religions have tried to bring the church down. And while individual churches have failed, the church is still here. That will be a sign of their destruction, their loss of eternal life in Christ. It's, it's kind of like this dark prediction of their eternal future. The church that stands on, the faith, on faith in Christ alone as evidenced by fruits of the indwelling Holy Spirit that perseveres, remains united, and is filled with confidence, that will be a clear sign that God is with the church and will also serve as a sign that the church is saved. The church that relies on the Holy Spirit, not giving up any ground for the sake of the gospel, that is a clear sign to the world of their salvation. Paul also adds that it's not of them. The church hasn't earned salvation. The Philippians didn't earn it by standing up to Roman pressures. The church doesn't earn it by standing up against whatever's going on outside the doors of the church. Salvation is from God. He's the one who grants salvation. He's the one who shows mercy. It isn't earned. You can't buy it. As we show that our faith is in Christ alone and our authority is the complete word of God, and we stand firm and we don't give up any ground for the sake of the gospel, and we humbly submit to remaining unified in Christ, and we do this with grace-filled confidence, we can be assured of our salvation. Because, quite honestly, that sort of behavior, <laughs> it's not normal. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Most people would just walk away from that. Like, people are nuts. But it's the spirit of Christ that strengthened Paul, and it's the same spirit that strengthens the church. It's the Spirit of God binding us all together as partners in the gospel that makes it possible for the church to be that way. And all of this is from God. All of this orchestrated by God from the beginning. The church is to cling to and contend for its faith in Christ, unified in the Spirit, confident that the gates of hell will not prevail, standing as a beacon of truth in the light and light in this world. And finally, Paul goes on to remind us that faith is a gift from God himself. We didn't conjure it up ourselves. No, no one wakes up one day and decides, you know what, I'm going to have faith in God today. It's that kind of day, I think I'll do it. <laughs> in verse 29 it says, For it has been granted to you, granted by grace, freely given, given by God. Your faith, your saving faith, has been graciously given to you. That gift was given to each and every one of his true believers for the glory of Christ. Salvation is of God, and so is faith. And it's all because of his grace. He's graciously saved us, and he has graciously given us the faith to be his people in the world. That sounds great, doesn't it? Well, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. You're saved by his grace, not by your works. You're an adopted child of God because of his grace, not by your works, not by anything you did. But let's see where Paul's going with this thinking. God has graciously given you, given you faith to believe, and also he has graciously given you suffering for his sake. It says that God granted faith for us to believe and to suffer for him. And you're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. I, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for suffering. That's not in the deal. Well, you're right. You didn't sign up for it. God signed you up for it. It's something that he granted us. In his grace, he gave it to us to suffer for the sake of Christ, to suffer for the sake of the gospel. How does that make any sort of sense? Well, we recall the words of James. 
He says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. We talked about that earlier. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Perseverance makes us mature and complete, not lacking anything. Therefore, trials and sufferings of many kinds lead us to maturity. That, that, that's all part of God's process to refine us. It purifies us by removing the impurities. It strengthens us through testing and pressure. For the Philippians, they, they saw what Paul suffered. If you look at Acts 16, verses 11 to 40, you see that he was dragged into the street, he was beaten, and he was locked up. They saw the whole thing. And they knew that what he was going through when he wrote this letter. And they're partners in the gospel with him. And they will suffer too for the sake of the gospel. And so will we. If you're living as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you're following the Lord. And you're not doing the things you used to do or acting the way you used to. That's because you have been redeemed. The old is gone. The new has come. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you now. And he's molding you into Christ-likeness. There's a good chance you're not going to be arrested for professing to be a Christian. There isn't a squad of officers coming in here to arrest us, at least not yet. (laughs) You might get some funny looks from people. Maybe someone will kind of break your chops about it a little bit. But there's a good chance you're not going to have your life threatened here for professing to be a Christian. Your friends may leave you. Some family members may start to cut you out. And that stings. That really stings when it happens. But that sting, that pain, is because you're suffering for the sake of the gospel. You're sharing in the suffering of Jesus, who knows loss. Jesus knows loss. And he knows what it means to be persecuted. Remember, his family rejected him. His closest friends that he taught and shepherded and lived with abandoned him in his real time of need. One of them even betrayed him. And there are many brothers and sisters in the church around the world, throughout this nation, and even in this church, who have come to know the Lord and have suffered a lot of rejection in their lives. They share in the suffering of Christ. So we have that as a privilege. We have the privilege to share in his suffering. So consider it pure joy. Knowing that you're joined by the church throughout the ages. Know that you're, you're joined by many churches around the world who suffer persecution. Know that you are joined by brothers and sisters in this church. You can rejoice in that. So let us be encouraged to hold strong to our faith. Let us hold strong to the truth found in the word of God. Let us draw upon the strength of the Holy Spirit so that we will persevere and not become complacent. So it will be unified and not divided. So it will be confident in our faith and not intimidated. Because we know the truth that Christ suffered and died and rose again. And he promised, I will be with you until the end of the age. So so may we live worthily as citizens of the kingdom of God, honoring the gospel of Jesus Christ, full of his spirit, humbly unified, confident that he is with us. And may we not only rejoice in our faith, but consider it joy when we're tested for his sake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, it is so easy for us to just walk away from it, isn't it? It would be so easy if we didn't have to struggle with this and contend with this. But you, you knew all along that this is, this is what we would be facing. You knew all along that the church would be tested this way. and You knew this. This is the way that you... You strengthen us. This is the way we we mature. So Lord, let us have hearts. Give us hearts that do rejoice when we suffer for your sake. The insults, when people abandon us, whatever it might be, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort us in those times so that we can truly rejoice, knowing that we're your children. That's evidence of it. We pray, Lord, for those around us. We pray for those in our family, our friends. We pray for the community around this church. We pray for the leaders in this community, in this state, in this country. We pray, Lord, that they they would repent and just turn to you. 
It's all about the gospel of Christ. It is all about what Jesus did on the cross. That's really all that matters. All this other stuff is just man-made nonsense. So, Father, we, we pray for them. We lift them up to you. We, we beseech you to reveal yourself to them. We beseech, beseech you to have your spirit fall upon all these areas, all these people. At the same time, Lord, we lift up as we, as we re- remembered the, the, the city of Jerusalem this morning. What a, what a mission field that is. You walked those streets. You wept over that city. So, Father, we pray, as your word says, we pray for peace, for peace in that land. Let her stand out separate from the world. And, Lord, we pray that Christ would be glorified there. We pray that the gospel would spread and continue to spread, and that you'd shine your light into the hearts of those who have grown cold. So, Lord, we thank you for this this conviction, this word, this promise, all this assurance from you. It's amazing that we can totally rely upon you, totally. So, Father, we pray when we leave here today, we pray here, we pray persevering. We pray unified. And we leave here confident, bold, knowing that we are citizens of your kingdom. We're your children. We are saints. We are priests. All the things that you said we are. And now, Lord, we gather together and we we share it with each other. We we, we say these words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And again, not only is just as a rote thing for us to do, but because they're the words of Christ. And when we repeat these words, it reminds us how we are to come before you in prayer. And so, Lord, we say these words together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread. Give us our debts. Give our debts. Give us not into temptation. For us from evil. Thine is the kingdom. Amen. Amen.